Hello, everyone. This is your vice president, Edward Tamesian. You all know I got that scholarly article that was accepted for publication three years ago on the origin of evil that's still available online. Today, we're going to be interviewing, once again, the legendary ex-Cuban spy and physicist, Bill Gady, and uh, Dr. Jason Thibodeau, who's one of our member at larges for Internet Infidels. All righty, Bill. So you have a very interesting topic you're going to discuss with us today. Why don't you tell us about it and we'll get on with the interview. Okay, well, let me let me start how I got into the business extinction business. <laughs> okay, because I was doing physics, studying physics, and I was a great follower, a very uh, strong fan of uh, Carl Sagan. And he not only talked about physics, he also talked about, you know, the future of man, where we were headed. Okay, and, uh, you know, I sympathize with just about everything he said, you know, I, I saw eye to eye with him just about on everything. And still, I started, do, uh, you know, deep uh, looking deeper at some of these issues, you know, investigating them on my own. And I reached uh, totally different conclusions. Now, what a lot of people, I can't say most people, but a lot of people out there think uh, the same way that Carl Sagan thought that, you know, somehow we were going to colonize first the uh, planets, move on to the nearest star, the Alpha Centauri system, probably a three star system out there. Um, in fact, Beta Centauri uh, is a sun, that, a star that's uh, very much like our sun. So there is a possibility there are planets similar to the Earth down there, you know. So, okay, so it, to me, it just sounded naturally, you know. Yeah, we colonize the uh, planets. Uh, we learn the techniques, we develop the technology, move on to a first star, then to other stars, then we colonize the galaxy and then the entire universe, I guess, right? It sounded to me logical, normal. I didn't even think about it. Like, that's okay, you know. Uh, the, I, I subscribe to that theory. When I started looking at uh, at this in a, uh, more deeply, right, uh, I'm looking at the relativists and they say, you know, we're going to go through the fourth dimension. And I said, whoa, wait a minute. <laughs> you know, worm holes, uh, black holes and so on. And that's when I started getting involved in that because they were suggesting that man was going to live forever or at least until the universe dies. In other words, uh, we're just going to continue living and developing technology and just moving on. And I said, well, I don't think we're going to go through wormholes to another universe. I don't think we're going to go through black holes into other stars or anything like that. I said, you know, I'm, I'm a little more down to earth guy. I, I want to see something I can understand. And I couldn't understand all that stuff. I said, you know, that's, that's beyond my understanding. And so uh, what I did was I started looking at, you know, um, what are the constraints to man? And one of them is the sun. You know, the sun is about to blow up, so the calculations say, in about 5 billion years. Well, I said, well, that's still a lot of time. I don't think it'll happen within my lifetime, you know, <laughs> so I don't have to worry about it. But I started looking in deeper, and I said, well, how do, how do we approach this question of extinction? And I, uh, this is the conclusion I read. I said, you, you first need to understand what happened in the past. How did the animals and the plants in the past die? How did they become extinct? And then we'll see if we can extrapolate those mechanisms, whichever ones those are, to man and see if we can elude them just, you know, with our intelligence, with our technology, our ability to see the future. We should be able to elude it, you know, whatever fought the animals, you know, we should be able to overcome that. And I started looking at uh, the extinction of animals in the past and all the way to Cambrian, uh, you know, Ordovician, uh, the whole works, all the way to, and, and uh, got to the Cretaceous. The Cretaceous is the most famous extinction, mass extinctions of dinosaurs. The last group of dinosaurs died. The first group died in the Jurassic. The second group died in the Cretaceous. And I said, how did they die? Well, uh, the most famous theory is this Alvarez theory. Uh, Lewis and Walter Alvarez, they got a paper published in 1980. And it's important to know that Lewis Alvarez was already a um, Nobel Prize winner. So he had his name already in lights. Here he came to help his son, Walter. They published this paper. And in it, 
they uh, created the theory we have today, which is that there was an asteroid strike on Earth. Well, when you look at the record, uh, you know, especially when you look at his paper, uh, if, if maybe uh, Jason can put that paper up there, the number one there, yeah. and you will find there that, um, you know, uh, what you see there, he doesn't tell you what the uh, cause of the extinction is. He just goes very briefly. He says, a hypothesis is suggested, uh, which accounts for the extinctions, et cetera, et cetera. And all he says, it was an extraterrestrial strike. That's it. And when you look at the paper, if you look at the next uh, slide there, number two. Okay. Give me a second. See if you can put that number two on, up there. <laughs> yeah, just give me one second. All right. Yeah. If you look at that, if you look at that last paragraph, uh, hmm. that's it. That's the whole theory that uh, the Alvarez proposed. Oh, you wiped it out. Yeah, no, uh, yeah, it didn't work. There yeah. it is. Now it's okay. I mean, yeah, okay. It, that we can see enough of it. Yeah. That's yeah, okay. So so he says in that last paragraph there, we will not go further into this matter, but we refer the reader to the proceedings of the 1976 Ottawa meeting, et cetera, et cetera, on uh, Cretaceous tertiary extinctions. So he doesn't tell you what the cause is. His paper, his the whole sole purpose of his paper is to present evidence. Okay. Mm -hmm. And we say evidence belongs to religion, not to science. Evidence is what you use to persuade people to think like you do. It doesn't mm -hmm. tell me a mechanism, which is what I was expecting from a scientist. And so if you look at this paper, you will not find the causes. You will have to go to that 1976 Ottawa meeting to find out all the um, theories proposed by different um, presenters on how the dinosaurs disappeared because of an impact. And the question is whether an impact can explain this, okay? If you go back in time, you'll find other people who've already had an impact theory, okay? And you'll see there, uh, number three. Um, yeah, give uh, me a second. I'm going to do something different. Yeah, yeah. Um, just give me one minute. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, I, I've got so many things to share. You want number three. Okay, got it. Yeah. There you go. Yeah, uh, this is Laubenfels, Max Laubenfels in 1956. He already talked about impact theories that some extraterrestrial object uh, hit the earth. Okay, and that's what killed the dinosaurs. So he was proposing this uh, in 1956, uh, 24 years before the, um, the Alvarez. And if you go back in time, you go to number four there. <laughs> You find these two fellows, and the first one, uh, Pierre Montparnasse, uh, he's uh, he already proposed that in 1742. He was probably the first guy to propose that uh, that uh, some extraterrestrial impact killed the animals in the past. And uh, if you go through other papers, that you know, I just want to establish that the theory of impact, uh, extraterrestrial impact, has been around for at least 200 years. The Alvarez did not discover anything, okay? And if you look at the next uh, paper, number five there. Okay, uh, this is one of the papers came out in 1993, 13 years after the Alvarez paper. It says, although Alvarez et al. presented the first evidence supporting this theory, the concept that an impact of an extraterrestrial object might produce a mass extinction on Earth, had been repeatedly proposed for more than two centuries. And he mentions Pierre uh, Maupertuis, okay? So, and the next one, if you look at uh, the following uh, paper there, I think it's uh, what, number six, uh, same thing. Uh, this is uh, another paper came out in 1998. And they mention again, uh, these La Laplace and Mar uh, Maupertuis um, as being the originators of an extraterrestrial impact, okay? So all these papers already talked about extraterrestrial impact. 
the theory is the cause, the mechanism is an extraterrestrial impact. The Alvarez did not discover this, but they got the cigar simply because they produced evidence, supposedly some iridium spread out throughout the world. The problem with the theory, and thank you, we can get rid of the, uh, the uh, uh, yeah, there we go. Uh, the problem with this theory is that an extraterrestrial impact cannot tell you uh, the only thing a, a, an extinction theory has to tell you, <laughs> has to explain, and that is selectivity. How does an asteroid select between one a group of animals and another group of animals? How does it leave some animals alive and kills the others? How does it kill some plants, leave some other plants alive? And more important than that, it, it's a little more detail. It, how can an asteroid explain chronological selectivity? What died were the old, the ancient animals. What continued, what survived into the tertiary were the modern animals, the mammals, you know, the uh, and the plants as well, the angiosperms uh, versus the gymnosperms. The gymnosperms had covered the land until um, the Cretaceous. And during the Cretaceous, the angiosperms, the flowering plants, uh, covered the land um, muscled them aside, muscled all the conifers aside. And with that radiation radiated, radiated as well the uh, mammals. They went right behind that, radi that, uh, that food source. And so it seems like, you know, an asteroid could not explain that. That takes uh, millions of years. In fact, I think it's uh, the next one down. There's a graph there. I think it's number... It's number eight. Number eight. Yeah, number eight. There you can see a paper that came out a few years ago. It took four years to uh, make that graph. They looked at countless papers and they assembled this graph and it's called the Cretaceous Terrestrial Revolution. And what you see there is what what caused the extinction? That's what you see there. <laughs> what you see is that the conifers, the uh, gymnosperms that had covered the land, and which is what the dinosaurs ate, started disappearing uh, probably around 130, 140 million years ago. And what took over the land were the angiosperms. They muscled all the other plants aside. And with those, what radiated were the mammals. Uh, first as tiny little rats underneath the feet of the um, dinosaurs. And later on, when the dinosaurs were gone, they, you know, they could take over the land because they had nothing to stop them. And that's how we are here today. <laughs> so that graph, the Cretaceous Terrestrial Revolution, tells me at least what actually happened. What happened was the food source uh, of the um, dinosaurs is what disappeared. They ate primarily conifers because they grew. They radiated with the conifers, first uh, starting in the tr Triassic. Then when the archosaurs went away, the big animals that dominated the land, it was the dinosaurs that took over the land, a certain type of dinosaurs, especially the long necks. When they disappeared at the end of the Jurassic, that's when other types of um, dinosaurs took over the land and eventually they disappeared when the food source disappeared. So my theory is that what caused all mass extinctions is uh, the uh, disappearance of the food sources. The food sources disappear <clears throat> because over time, oh, no plant lives forever. No type of plant lives forever. No family of plants, no order of plants lives forever. And what happens is you have a certain uh, period, millions of years in which plants live and throughout that time, they evolved animals, uh, especially herbivores, right? Uh, uh, you know, they squat niches within that um, uh, vegetation and the carnivores develop in relation to that, to, to those uh, herbivores. And so you have this world in which an arms race develops and the animals grow to big sizes. But at some point, the... Um, the ecological pyramid overturns, the plants have to die, and slowly in the last few million years, uh, their varieties and their, their quantities start shrinking, and another types of plants parallel to those 
different types of plants begin to take over the land. And with those new plants, you have a certain type of animal that ex radiates with it at the expense of the big guys who are now old, who've been around for too long, and it's their time to die. And so what I'm saying is uh, mass extinctions are caused by um, what, what I call the overturning of the ecological pyramid. It's the population pyramid overturn of the plants and the ecological uh, overturn uh, pyramid of the uh, pyramid overturn of the animals. That's the mechanism. Once we understand that, we say, can we extrapolate that mecha those mechanisms, those two mechanisms to man? Can he do anything about it? And my answer to that is no. <laughs> we cannot do anything about it. What's the issue? The issue is, and again, you can take that one away. The uh, There we go. Um, what's the issue? The issue is that um, we cannot do anything about our eco ecological pyramid overturn. And um, we can't do anything about our, even our personal, you know, uh, our species um, population pyramid overturn. Our population pyramid has begun to overturn since 1963. And what I mean by overturning, I mean, we had a, we had a, a, a mass extinction, you could say of humans in the 14th century because we had the, or the theory goes it was the bubonic plague killed lots of people but we were still a young um, species we were still reproducing heavily we, we had 10 kids 15 kids half of them died seven of them lived you know and we just kept populating the planet but in 1963 something happened because since then we went from 2.3 uh, growth rate population growth rate today we're down to uh, one and by mid-century of this century, uh, we're projected to reach what is known as zero population growth. So our population pyramid has inverted and there's nothing we can do to overturn it again. We cannot make it, uh, we cannot have 10 kids again per family in great measure because we moved to the cities. We, we had this tremendous migration from the country to the cities because that's where the jobs were especially today with services. And that's different than the world we had when we were in the farms and people had, you know, 10, 15 kids, no problem, one per year. That's that you can't have 10 kids in an apartment, not in a city. And so as we move to the cities, every country in the world has this uh, transition going on where people are moving from the country to the cities. We stop having kids. When we stop having kids, that population period mode overturns, people become older. The population as, you know, as a whole becomes older and uh, we reproduce fewer children. And so because of that, you know, the population, the total population starts approaching what is known as zero population growth. And after that, we only have three possibilities. We either continue growing, we go more or less uh, stay stable on Earth, or we go down to extinction. And I'm saying we're going to take that third route. We're going to go down to extinction but not because our population pyramid has overturned. What's gonna kill us is the economy. What killed the dinosaurs was their economy. What killed the Triassic, uh, uh, what is it? Uh, the uh, archosaurs was their economy. Economics is the management of resources. The mm -hmm. only resource any animal uh, manages is food. That's what he's interested in. The next day, he's got to find new food somewhere, any way he can find it, especially a carnivore. He's got to go out and hunt somehow, some way. And so uh, the, the issue is that we all manage uh, economics. We all manage our resources. And our resources, the way we manage them is we produce food artificially. Okay, But we produce food artificially only because of money. And money is an abstraction that we all have agreed to respect, you know, in God we trust. And so <laughs> here we have this abstraction on which our very lives depend. If money were to disappear, you know, imagine God just comes in there with his magic wand, makes all money disappear. We suddenly don't believe in money. Nobody accepts money. Well, that's the end of the world. 
He doesn't need to have it rain 40 days and 40 nights. We can do it simply by wiping out the money. You know, if, if he just comes in there and says, don't believe in money anymore, don't accept money anymore, we're dead because the whole world runs on money. Whatever money is out there, that's what it runs on. And there's different types of money that we've created over the years. Now, what's the issue? The issue is that you say, well, why will we stop accepting money? How will money die? How is it that we will become atheists in money? And I'm saying that what's happening in the world now, you, you, the growth is coming to a halt, the real growth. What we have now is a lot of uh, creation, money creation. We've had this for many years now where we create money, but we're not producing actual real uh, growth. And the new generation has no place in which to move within this economic system. What's going to happen at some point because more, more and more people will find it harder to get to the end of the month. The governments are going to have to help them. There's a lot of subsidies uh, going on in different parts of the world right now. And some uh, it's going to come to a point where not even that money is going to get them to the end of the month. They will not be able to live till the end of the month with whatever money they get, either through jobs, low-paying jobs, or through government help. And at that point, you know, people will, uh, there, there will be a crisis at some point. More people will be laid off from factories because there will, will be less and less disposable income to buy uh, things, especially uh, expensive things like, such as cars and houses. So those markets will start becoming flatter and flatter. People will be laid off. That only uh, it reinforces the cycle, okay? It's a self uh, perpetuating uh, cycle. And at some point, people will not accept money. They they will rather barter if they could, you know, uh, trade something for something. But I'm saying there's going to be a crisis where the whole global economy finally collapses. And that's why money will be no more. When money is no more, when money is no more, people cannot trade because anyone who's lived like me in the Stone Age, <laughs> you learn one thing as a hunter-gatherer. Uh, you don't trade food and food is the only thing that's important because it keeps you alive and um, food is what all animals manage and we're animals when we go back to the stone age in the cities when we live in the asphalt jungle and money is no more the only thing of value will be food you will not be able to trade your car for a banana nobody will give you the banana for your car in fact, we'll wait you out till wait till you die, and I'll keep the car afterwards if I can. But nobody trades food, and that's the only thing of value because nothing else will have value. And so, what I'm saying is, this is the mechanism of extinction of man, and I think this is what happened in the past as well. There were economic collapses where the environment collapsed, and in our case, it's the food that we produce. We only produce it because of money. Um, if you don't pay the worker, he doesn't produce it. If you don't pay the transporter, he doesn't transport the uh, food to the cities. And we're all stuck with this money system that we create an artificial system. And that's the only thing that keeps us alive today. And that's what's so incredible that in abstractions such as money, any type of money, even gold, keeps us alive only because we believe in it. And the moment we stop believing it, we're all dead. Gotcha. All righty. Awesome, Bill. And then uh, before, I'm, I'm going to let Jason comment um, on, you know, what you've said. Uh, it was very interesting. Thanks for sharing it again. So uh, before uh, I do that, I'm just I have your paper here, the uh, unsubstantiability by Bill Gady. Uh, and it's, you know, the, the paper that I was talking to you about before. Uh, yeah. And uh, I'm just going to read the abstract real quick so people can have a good summary of what you just said. And you can look at it online. Just look up Bill Gady, The Extinction of Man. So I'll just read the abstract real quick, and then I have a question for you. So uh, yeah. Bill says, it will not be extraterrestrial impacts, disease, or other extrinsic, extrinsic agents that will cause the extinction of man but rather the collapse of this artificial economy. We argue that there is no productive category of the economy beyond the service sector in which to shift the global workforce. As the agriculture, manufacturing, and service sectors continue to shed workers in a bid to reduce costs, this inevitability feeds unemployment. A global economic regime in which an ever-decreasing pool of workers subsides 
an ever-growing army of unemployed is axiomatically unsubstantiable and conduces to system breakdown. That fateful day, profit-minded agricultural corporations will have no further incentive to produce food or deliver it to the cities. All righty. And so my question is, Bill, um, you know, someone might come up and say, you know, we've always gotten past apparent problems. Like, you know, when the Great Depression happened, or when, you know, those plagues way back in the day happened, we always found a way to get out of it somehow. Because, you know, we're very intelligible creatures. And uh, we, we've we developed, you know, uh, good ways of coping with, you know, problems that seem, you know, like they're going to be like the end of the world, so to speak. And we'll just be able to do something now, just like we did back then, you know, and get out of this problem. What would you have to say to that? What makes this situation different from all those times in the past? Uh, maybe the best way to look at this is the, what is that? Uh, let me see if I can get this um, graph, which is the last, I think it's number 16. You can put that one up there, which is yeah, a good Jason. way of talking about it with that one in front of us. This is the history of economic modes of man of our species right right yeah. what i'm what i show here what i show here is that for 200 300,000 years that our species you know humans have been on the planet uh for most of that time we were hunter gatherers about 10,000 years ago plus or minus a couple maybe right we went into farming we went to agriculture okay so we were um farmers for maybe 10,000 years or so and then about 300 years, we went into the era of industrialization, manufacturing, okay? That lasted only 300 years, you know, 200, 300 years. And about 50 years ago, um, we went into services. Services overtook both manufacturing and farming, both in a uh, number of workers as well as GDP. So in both categories, uh, services is now uh, ranking, you know, number one. And about 10 years ago, maybe 15, maybe less, maybe more, um, we went to special types of services, which are internet services. Uh, a lot of people are moving into ads, entertainment, okay, and things of that nature, and they do it all through the internet. And so what you're seeing here is an evolution of our economic, of the mode, of our economic mode, as I call it, right? Uh, we were not always hunter-gatherers. We were not always farmers. We were not always manufacturing. There is no way we can go back from services back to manufacturing or to farming or to hunter-gathering as the main mode of our economic system. Uh, we cannot go to hunter-gathering. I think we can all understand that. There's nothing to hunt on the highway. No wildebeest running around there. Okay? And uh, so if you can understand that much, the, that extreme, uh, you can still get to understand that we will not go into farming where everybody goes out and has a little plot of land and starts doing his own thing, you know, planting potatoes. I don't think that's uh, ever going to happen, uh, not on a massive scale. Uh, the big corporations, agricultural corporations, have taken over the land. They produce the food for the cities, and that's how our economic system runs today. Manufacturing uh, increased tremendously in the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century. And it was the prime mode, you know, we call them industrialized nations. That's, that's the term we used to use. We don't use that anymore, <laughs> you know, uh, but that's what they were. They were industrialized nations. They, we invented the car, the airplane, the telephone, you know, and then we started selling all these things. But that to, uh, was taken over by services. And now we're in a service mode so we're not in the same situation that we were in the 19 in 1929 when the stock market crashed. In those days, we went into this depression, not only in the United States, but in Europe and worldwide in general, right? And it was a time that we were still in the manufacturing, really transitioning in many countries from farming into manufacturing. Now we're in a different mode. We're all in the cities, okay? We live in big cities, most of the people. Uh, we are urbanites. And within the cities, we do services, primarily services, okay? Most of the population, for example, a country like the United States and most of the countries here in Europe, about 80 to 85% of their population and GDP is uh, service related. Whereas about 14% is um, 
manufacturing, and only about one or two percent is is agriculture. By by agriculture, we also include things like foresting and so on. But you know, we're talking really about food. We produce food so easily today. You know, massively for eight billion people on the planet, and that's amazing. But it's also so dangerous because. All our food is in the hands of a few, and they do it only for commercial purposes. <laughs> they don't do it for our health. Okay, so I'm saying that we have a depression now. It's going to be nothing like the depression of the 30s. Okay, we're in a different mode. Okay, and again, uh, I also want to draw a distinction between what happened in the 14th century with the bubonic plague, where we lost a lot of people. They say anywhere from a third to a half of uh, the population of Europe died. Uh, today, it's not that we die all of a sudden, it's that we're not producing children since 1963. The, the growth rate for the planet as a whole is coming down. Countries even like Nigeria are not producing seven children per family anymore. They're producing like three or four now on the average. And so even their rate has gone down. Why? Because people move to the cities. And in the cities, you cannot have children, whether you're in a poor country or in a rich country. And so we have a different situation, the depression that would, uh, in fact, I think we're going to go into a depression, uh, which probably is coming up in a few months or a few years. Uh, that depression is not going to go away so easily as it went uh, uh, in the 19, end of the 1930s, which is when the World War II started and put people to work again. It was the war really that uh, got people working again and got us out of the depression. Okay. Uh, manufacturing started putting out, you know, a lot of uh, airplanes and cannons and guns and whatever, and that helped a lot, uh, getting people back to work. So the war was good, but even a war today would not help us in that sense because, uh, you know, everybody's already got the weapons they need, and if they need more weapons, they just crank the production lines. It's not like it's going to create a manufacturing industry. It's not going to revive the manufacturing industry to the point that it overtakes services ever again. And so we've got a different situation today. Uh, depression is not going to be the same thing as in the 30s. All right. Okay. All right, Jason. So um, what do you have to say to Bill? Any questions or comments? <clears throat> so, yeah, um, several things. I, I want to start with talking about the extinction of the dinosaurs. Okay. Um, so I guess I start with two questions about that. One is about dinosaurs and one is about gymnosperms. So, and basically, it's the same question. Neither group went extinct. Um, so in other words, you, you wanted to explain the extinction of dinosaurs, but that never happened. What happened was that certain dinosaur species went extinct, not the, the clade known as dinosaurs. They are still around. And the same thing with gymnosperms. Gymnosperms didn't go extinct. They're still around. So What dinosaurs are alive today? What's that? You said dinosaurs are not extinct? That's correct. You're right. Yeah. So, uh, what, eagles, what, what, pigeons, what dinosaurs are alive today? Eagles and pigeons and no, 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 no. Those are not dinosaurs. <laughs> They're known as birds. There's a theory that they originated with dinosaurs, but we don't call them dinosaurs. I don't. It's well, that's not my to say that they're dinosaurs. That's not my understanding. My understanding is that they are theropod dinosaurs, but I'm not a paleontologist or a dinosaur expert but if you but just i mean not that this is definitive but if you look on the wikipedia entry for bird it says birds are a clade of of uh, theropod dinosaurs so i yeah, think I okay <laughs> so but but the point is that um so 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 forget about the dinosaurs gymnosperms didn't go extinct yeah, and uh, we're not saying that ferns went extinct. We're not saying that uh, conifers went extinct. What we're saying here first, the number of varieties first reduced significantly. That's one issue. And remember, the more varieties there are, the more niches that animals can uh, exploit. And the fewer there are, you have less uh, evolution of animals that eat ferns or that eat uh, conifers or whatever. That's one issue. The other issue is that the quantity reduced drastically. You had forests of cycads and cycadioids in the Jurassic and in the Cretaceous. And those forests, I mean, it, it used to, if, uh, there's a place in uh, South Dakota, um, I can't remember the name, it's uh, I think Cycad National Park, something like that. 
And they have all these fossils because it was a forest of cycads or cycadioids. And, you know, they're rock today. They're, they're no longer around. <laughs> and today we don't have uh, cycadioids or cycads. Uh, there's a couple still uh, plants of that nature alive today, like the ginkgos. But my point is, imagine these forests. They said uh, what I call the shrinking island. You're in a forest, right? And you have all these animals. And the forest now shrinks, or the island shrinks. Well, the more it shrinks, because you're losing vegetation, the one that the animals eat, well, the fewer uh, animals it can sustain. So the animals have what is known as density-dependent birth rates, where, if, where they adjust their numbers to the uh, food that is available. And so as the forest shrinks, the animals adjust their populations downwards. And at some point, you know, they, they go extinct because they simply, you know, it's unsustainable for them anymore. And so you don't have to have a complete extinction of the, of the um, conifers. The other thing you'll notice, if you look at our map, our globe, the conifers used to be throughout uh, everywhere. And today they're in the northern and southern hemispheres. The angiosperms kind of pushed them to the north and south poles. <laughs> so if you want to see conifers, you got to go north. You won't see them in Jamaica. <laughs> Maybe one, I don't know. But in general, that's been the trend. And so it, it, just imagine that if the trees are migrating northwards in the sense that uh, because of climate or because the angiosperms are pushing them out and these uh, trees end up tolerating more and more freezing temperatures and can withstand it. Well, the animals, uh, you know, they, they, they were in a certain region where, where they uh, live. They were, in, um, they were sedentary in, in, uh, at the end of their lives, at the end of their reign of the dinosaurs. They were sedentary. So when the forest disappeared, it's not like they're saying, oh, I'm going to migrate north to the North Pole to get some food. You know, when the forest disappeared, they disappeared locally because they, that's where they lived in the last few, maybe millions of years. And so you got I think you gotta look at all these little factors to find out why they disappeared. It's not like all the conifers disappeared, all the dinosaurs disappeared. It said, well, the dinosaurs did disappear. <laughs> I'll take an exception on the birds, uh, <laughs> but the conifers did disappear, you know, uh, uh, did not disappear. They just moved northwards. And if you look at the conifers, another thing you should notice is that they are the trees among the trees that live the most. You, you got 2,000, 3,000 year old redwoods and so on that, uh, you know, these trees live for uh, forever. Why? Because they've had a long history of evolution and they're at the end of their lives. Uh, you know, you don't find redwoods all over the planet. You find them in their last, making their last stand out there in California, you know, and, and that's where they're going to die. <laughs> that's, that's, the end of the redwoods uh and they probably started out in the cretaceous or who knows you know millions of years ago but you know they they suffer their their population pyramid and so, uh, they don't have so, to go completely so so what um and my other question had to do with um the asteroid uh it didn't seem like anything you said rules out that the, the asteroid had some kind of uh con contributing impact uh, effect um, I don't think there was an asteroid. I don't think Chicxulub is an asteroid impact. They just made it. Uh, the evidence uh, that th it's like they forced the evidence onto the ast uh, to the crater that's underneath the the ground there. I, I, I'm not sure that is. They have not shown that that is um, an asteroid impact. And if I looked at many astro uh, asteroid hits, you know, you look at craters throughout the Earth. And this one doesn't look anything similar to it, but they look at if um, if some of the uh, uh, evidence that is around the asteroid, uh, around the, that crater, around that hole, uh, is indicative of an asteroid impact. And it's like, you know, I think they're forcing it, saying there was an asteroid, they were looking for it, and they say, oh, we found it here. But even, let's concede it's an asteroid impact. You know, you cannot explain, you cannot explain with an impact cell activity. Why did the dinosaurs die and the mammals survive? Why did the angiosperms survive? And why did all the, or most of the conifers and ferns die out? So you cannot explain that with an asteroid strike first. And second, 
those um, plants and animals were disappearing in the last few uh, million years of the Cretaceous. They were already on their way out. You cannot explain that long period with a single strike of an asteroid. Um, yeah, I'm not sure about that. I mean, I, obviously, I, I don't know anything uh, about the whether the impact site really is an asteroid site. I'm totally ignorant of the details there. But I'm not sure that it can't be a contributing factor, even if your explanation is the primary one, because um, s smaller animals um, might consume less food. They might can be able to consume food that the large animals don't have access to um so a worldwide uh you know cat catastrophic catastrophic event which suppressed plant life plant reproduction or you know plant growth might have had a a, a or, or i guess my question is couldn't it have had a selective impact on larger animals versus smaller because of its impact <laughs> on plants well, the, the, the first thing we need to notice about that is that in all mass extinctions, what died was the big and what was left behind was the small. And uh, they all have the same situation. What died was the old and the big and what survived was the small and the, and the um, uh, you, you know, in, in other words, what, what died was one, what I call one um, food chain and what survived was another food chain that was not dependent on the first one. With By food chains, you can explain that. But but you know, in the in the case of uh, uh, saying that you know that the um, small and the big, you know, it, it's not a question of small and big. It's a question of old and new, primarily because what died is the old. Look look at all mass extinctions. What died were the animals that had been around for a while. You know, uh, and what survived was the animals that were just starting out and they ate something different than this other uh, um, food chain. So with and look, look at the uh, also the oceans, the oceans. It's also an issue of food chain. What died was one food chain, for example, just as, a, as an example, you know, the um, uh, reptiles of the at the end of the um, Cretaceous, they were monsters. They were big the mosasaurs, you know, they were big monsters. What did they eat? Well, they ate ammonites. What did the ammonites eat? Well, they ate plankton. And the specific plankton, the specific ammonites, they finally disappeared at the Cretaceous, no more ammonites after that. And the, uh, these mosasaurs, they formed a, a specific food chain, but all three of them disappeared. You know, and here were the uh, sharks and other animals running around the fish. They had no problem. And you say, what happened? How, how did the asteroid manage to avoid those and kill just the reptiles that were around for a long time. That's why they were so big due to what is known as Cope's law. The animals get bigger and bigger because of the arms race over millions of years. And the, what died were the big guys and they ate the ammonites. The ammonites ate the, the uh, uh, these plankton and they all were wiped out. Yeah, I have a hard time believing that selectivity can be produced by a smart ask. So okay, so this is a place where I also am quite ignorant, but um, cartilaginous fish are quite old uh, as a group, right? Uh, which ones? Cartilaginous, non-bony fish. Sure. Oh, yeah. Well, you know, yeah, uh, the, the answer is yes, but you have to keep in mind that we say, oh, crocodiles have been around for 300 million years or 100 million years. That's not true. No animal lives that long. There are no such thing as Lazarus species. There's even, even bacteria have changed since the uh, or uh, since the uh, days of the um, uh, Ordovician and uh, you know since the beginning of, of life, uh, we don't have the same bacteria or even the same viruses today that were around in those days. And so everything uh, changes over time. To say that you know a lungfish today is the same lungfish that was there you know in the uh, uh, the Bonian, uh, you know, it's it's not true. It's that animal did not survive millions of years. It's in fact, if if you would compare them, you they would not be able to mate. They would not be able. To, you would find out that they're not the same species. You know, because they would but not the, be able to produce uh, viable offspring. I guess what I'm saying, you're saying the old and the big died, yeah. But there were big 
maybe there weren't, but I mean, there were very, there were cartilaginous fish around during the extinction of the dinosaurs. Yeah. And they were very old. And yet they Which didn't. <laughs> that, that, you got to be specific there because, yeah, we can't talk as a family because there are different cartilaginous uh, uh, fish. You know, not all of them, not all of them belong to the same families. You know, they, they, they uh, you, we got to look at the trees uh, where they branched out and you say, well, this branch disappeared and this one continued and look at the reasons why that happened, you know, why that difference. But yeah, I mean, you got to do a specific analysis there, not talking general, you know, because, uh, you know, <laughs> we need more information there. Right. Well, that's one of the reasons I brought up the birds, which we don't agree about, but. No. <laughs> uh, but my birds point are not was, dinosaurs. <laughs> <laughs> Chickens um, are not dinosaurs. <laughs> you know, like, I. I I disagree, and I think that okay, there are no who disagree, but that's fine. But, <laughs> um, but again, I, I, my my point was just that I don't think it's true that all dinosaurs died in the extinction event. I, they I, did. I, <laughs> they did. There are no dinosaurs. <laughs> okay. It's not well. Let, let's look at this. There are two things. We have the reptiles that flew in the air, like the uh, pterodactyls. And you had the reptiles in the seas. Those disappeared completely. There are no reptiles of that nature around today. Dinosaurs on land, you know, like the long necks or T. rex kind of animals or any of those, uh, ankylosaurs, none of those are around today. Uh, maybe there is a dinosaur somewhere. I don't think there is, but let's assume there is. For all practical purposes, you can say they became extinct. Even in that case, even if we find one alive tomorrow, you know, but uh, when you're talking about birds, now we're talking about a different category, a different <laughs> branch that originated much earlier, you know, so I don't think you can compare the birds today with the uh, end of the Cretaceous dinosaurs. Uh, we're talking about, you know, two different categories here. Different orders. Well, they're certainly related to the theropods, even if we don't classify them as theropod dinosaurs. Well, we're related to the mammal reptiles, but not because of that. We can say that the mammal reptiles, the synapsids of the uh, Permian, are alive today. We are alive because we descend from them, probably, or some animal that existed in those days. For sure, we can. I'm sure humans can take, uh, you know, can trace our lineage all the way to the Cambrian. For sure, there's some animal that gave birth to some other animal, to some other animal, some other animal, and at some point we arose. So every animal on earth should be able to trace his lineage all the way to the Cambrian. Now, exactly, uh, are there uh, mammal-like reptiles from the Permian alive today? I would say no. Those animals were tigers that laid eggs. <laughs> and that's well, what but, they were. <laughs> so, okay, but I don't know. I mean, let me try to make this point. I, at some point, the theropod dinosaurs and the birds diverge. We'll just decide that, that birds are not theropods. So okay. they diverged. But then my point is that the ancestors of today's birds were around during the extinction of the larger dinosaurs, yeah. the long necks and the, and the uh, large theropods, and they, they did not go extinct. Now, right. they, they're no older, or they're no younger, or yeah, they're not they're not younger than many of the theropod dinosaurs that did go extinct in terms of it, the age of the species, right? So you have theropods and then you have radi radiation, new species of theropods, but you still have the bird lineage around as well. Those species that did not go extinct are not somehow older than the ones that, than the, than the theropod species that did go extinct. Well, yeah, uh, that's a good point. My uh, take on that is that the people, the uh, animals that ruled the skies at the end of the Cretaceous were the reptiles. You know, they, they had these giant uh, reptiles uh, yeah. running around, you know, and um, what birds there were and were the, those birds. In fact, I would say that none of those birds are the ones that are alive today. So you do have this branching out from from whatever's left over. Whatever, uh, again, uh, killed the dinosaurs uh, was not part of their, um, you know, in, in the case of the birds, they were not part of that 
um, uh, uh, food chain. In other words, the food chain of that died had nothing to do with the birds that were flying around. And so even though they, you can say, well, their lineage comes from the same root, just like ours comes from the mammal-like reptiles, you know, it doesn't mean that because of that, you know, in the case of the mammal-like reptiles, they didn't eat angiosperms because in those days there were no angiosperms. Angiosperms were invented much later. In those days, what you had were ferns and what survived all the way to the end of the uh, Triassic were the what is known as the seed ferns, specifically the seed ferns. We don't have seed ferns today. Those are completely gone. And the animals that lived in those days, that's what they survived on because that's almost everything that covered the land. There were no conifers, there were no angiosperms. And when the seed ferns went away and were taken over by the cycads and the other conifers, well, that's when the uh, dinosaurs radiated. So it's got to do with a food chain. And I'm saying that the birds that arrived today uh, did not eat uh, what the uh, conifers. <laughs> and I don't think I don't think you can feed conifers to a chicken. <laughs> right. So, and so you would make the same claim about the cartilaginous fish. <clears throat> The, the sharks that survived. That's, that's why I'm saying we have to look at uh, specifics, what they ate, how old they really are, in, in the sense of when did their lineage start? The the lineage that is a, of the uh, fish that are alive today. You know, we say, well, when did that specific lineage start? And you might find out it started after the Cretaceous, maybe. You know, I mean, that's why we have to look at it uh, in more detail, find out exactly what... Um, dynasty we're referring to here so um another point would be speed that it does seem and I, this is just a, a kind of a guess on my part that herbivores are more susceptible to this kind of thing than carnivores um herbivores tend to have diets that are more specific we eat this kind of we can eat ferns but then when you introduce grasses or when you introduce um flowering plants we can't eat it right um right. That seems to be still today even true of modern uh, herb herbivores. You can't oh. give a bunch of pine needles to a cow. That's not going to be a good thing for the cow to eat. <laughs> um, so, no. In fact, they say that uh, horses get sick when they eat um, conifers. Yeah, yeah. They have eaten exactly. them and they get sick. It's yeah. not natural for them to eat that. They probably don't have the proper bacteria or bugs in their stomach to digest that. But for carnivores, it doesn't seem to be as big of a problem. As long as there's a prey source, we can eat it. it you know what I mean? Um, well, maybe, because uh, I look at two things there. One is size. Uh, you know, you had all these rat-sized mammals in the at the end of the Cretaceous. I don't think the T-Rex, uh, T-Rex would probably eat them, but that's a potato chip. You know, yeah, it's yeah. not going to fill them. So he's not, and, and probably he's not going to spend all that energy running around these little mice that probably ran all or circles around them. Uh, you know, he went after big game. And so one thing is size. The yeah. other one is that uh, it's like us eating ants. Well, yeah, some people might eat ants and bugs and so on, but in general, we don't. And it's like, it's not your choice of food. <laughs> and I'm sure the uh, T-Rexes would see those rats as, as uh, ants and uh you know, the spiders, not as real food, you know, so yeah, I think, think there's a lot of that involved there. Yeah, that sounds, that seems right to me. The The large carnivores are certainly going to prey upon large game. And so when that, those species of prey are gone, the carnivores are not going to be able gone. to do anything. Yeah. The, whole, the, whole, the whole um, uh, food chain collapses, and that would explain why the dinosaurs disappeared, why the reptiles, certain reptiles disappeared, but not all the others. Because you have other, you have snakes and you have turtles that survived and they're reptiles or considered, you know, within the reptile family and they survived. So it's this reptile survived, but this one did not. And you, if maybe if you look at the food they ate, you know, like if you look at the turtles, you know, I don't think they eat uh, conifers either, you know or cycads yeah. or whatever. Remember, a lot of these animals ate cycads. Cycads is a type of, uh, or, or cycadioids, Williamsonias and so on. Uh, those are a specific type of conifer, but they are conifers. And, uh, you know, we don't eat those. And I don't think any mammal likes the, that kind of food. You know, they, they stick to angiosperms. 
We are angiosperms, uh, mammals at least. We eat the seeds of conifers. Some, uh, lots of animals, lots of birds do, um, and humans do. We 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 definitely harvest the seeds. Yeah, maybe seeds. here and there we eat some yeah. things that are like they say that we can also eat certain parts of the fern. But as far as I'm concerned, uh, or the, as far as I know, uh, some of those uh, uh, plants are really poisonous for us. Yeah, we can't eat the. Yeah, we don't eat pine needles. <laughs> um, but um, and we can't yeah, switch overnight. Also, what's that? We cannot switch overnight. Uh, like yeah, yeah. Uh, like if suddenly you don't have any lettuce, you're not going to say, "Oh, I'm just going to eat some pine leaves." No, it's <laughs> you can't do, make that change all of a sudden. It takes years, many years to get used to eating pine trees. <laughs> so let me shift gears. I'm sorry. I don't know. Maybe I should let Ed say some things, but I wanted to shift gears to talk about humans because that's obviously. Okay. Like, yeah. Let's go with humans now. <laughs> yeah. It's all on you. Okay. So, <laughs> so a lot of this conversation is directed at, in, in my own mind, at least of thinking about what's going to happen if it is true, if it ever happens that that people stop accepting money as valuable. Um, and I certainly agree, if that does happen, a lot of people are gonna die. Uh, but I'm not sure that that means that human, human beings become extinct. And one of the reasons I think that is that humans are omnivores, um, so we we can adapt to different food sources and, as and we're not huge in the way that the long-necked dinosaurs were or T-Rex. So our 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 needs in terms of daily intake of calories are lower. Um, so we can survive on not a whole lot of calories. We can survive on meat. We can survive on a lot of different plants, even though we can't eat all plants. So why not think that even if this catastrophe happens, that humans stop believing that money is valuable um why not think there could be remnant populations of humans that learn to go back to farming methods and hunter gathering methods and even though the population is very small there's still humans around okay there's several things involved in that um one is that we will kill each other okay so there's going to be a uh, uh a, a massive killing not only starvation, but killing, as people desperate for food, uh, rob, steal, kill, think of the worst, uh, the animal in us comes out. We have no more uh, cavalry coming to save us. There is no more law, no more courts, no more prisons. It's just, uh, again, the days of the hunter gathered, but in the cities, in an asphalt jungle. Okay, so very little food. People uh, will probably uh, do things to each other. That's one issue. Robbing, killing, all that good stuff. Uh, cannibalism. Think about that as well. I'm sure the T-Rexes cannibalized other T-Rexes uh, towards the end. In fact, uh, the dinosaur Sue, uh, they don't know if it was a female or not, but it's in the Chicago Museum there. And she's got bite marks that they say were could have only been put there by another T-Rex. So there could have been some cannibalism, that sort of thing. And we can expect the same thing among humans. It's happened when people starve to death. Not always, but, you know, they had uh, issues uh, like Moby Dick, you know, the uh, Nantucket uh, ship that went under in the 19th century. And the survivors, uh, you know, they ate a couple of the dead people and also had to kill one in order to eat them. So we act very strangely in those situations. That's one issue. But the other issue is that all the food, whatever food there is, uh, first, we don't grow any more food when, when the econo global economy collapses. At that moment, all food production stops, let alone distribution. So if you want food, you're gonna have to go out of the city, right? Because whatever food's in the city, that's gonna be over within a month at least. And at that point, we all have to go out and whoever's alive, they go out, where would they go? Well, they have to go to the farms and in the farms, there's going to be a big killing because here you have a farmer. He's going to try to protect whatever he's got, but everybody wants to share in his bounty. <laughs> mm -hmm. So you have everybody going into the fields, going to the cows, going to the chickens, to whatever they can find, killing them and eating. And aside from killing each other for those goods, right? So all this thing I think is going to happen. And uh, so at this point, you ask, 
well, uh, am I going to plant? Am I going to be able to plant potatoes, for example? Well, it's not going to be so easy because you're going to, is what I call a hoplite. Hoplites in the uh, Greek army, they were, because they carried the hoplon, which was their shield. That's why they were known as hoplites. And they were farmers by day and uh, 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 soldiers by night, so to speak. They, they were farmers, but they say, hey, we got a war against the Persians. Oh, okay. So they would grab their hoplons and their spears and go and swords and go out and fight. Then they come back and again, they tended to their farms. So they were farmers and soldiers. And that's what we're going to have to be, whoever survives, because suddenly he's going to have to plant food, thinking ahead for the next few months. He's going to be able to, he's going to have to be able to harvest it, <laughs> defend it. And here you have thousands of people coming from the cities. And again, they want to join in this bounty. And I'm not sure you're going to be able to defend what you have and also plant and, you know, have a great time. The other thing is that I think you need a group that trusts each other to survive. You cannot survive alone and say, oh, I'm going to survive by myself. I'm going to plant my garden and I don't care what happens out there. And if the government fell and the economy fell, I don't care about that. I'm just going to plant my, my garden, my cow, my pigs. You know, it's not going to be like that. If you're going to survive, you're probably going to have to have a group and that group has to be very uh, faithful to each other. You know, you have to be able to trust them. They're going to have to defend. They're going to have to plan. They're going to have to defend, uh, you know, the, the land. So it's not going to be so easy as saying, oh, I'm just going to plant some, some things here. And uh, uh, if uh, taking that one more, one step further, people in the cities, you know, like we're all in the service industry, most of us, a lot of people, or I'd say at least 80, 85% of us. And, you know, for that person to suddenly become a farmer and uh, without uh, the proper tools, the proper seeds, the proper, uh, you know, things that you need to grow crops, I don't think it's going to happen overnight that you go out there and say, oh, I'm, yeah, I'm going to become a farmer. You know, yesterday I was doing some programming. Now I'm going to do farming. So I'll, I think you got to take all these things into consideration, you know, and some people say, well, how about the lost tribes? Well, first of all, we have no lost tribes. You know, we've invented something called a satellite and we've located every little inch on earth. We know where everybody is. Now, if if we have that information and you live close to a lost tribe or some people who live in, you know, uh, in, in the hunter uh, gatherer stage, well, uh, people from the city are just going to invade them, take whatever they have or kill the animals that they hunted. You know, they're just going to wipe out all the animals. Remember, we, we are 8 billion people. And I think if we go to the forests and the jungles, we're going to wipe out everything that's alive, that's walking. You know, we're that smart. We have guns. We have uh, lots of ways of doing that, especially if you're starving. You're going to hunt everything in sight. And so, well, you know, I think we're going to wipe out everything. But we're not going to be 8 billion people when we start going into the map, into the forest. We're not going to be 8 billion people anymore. I mean, if no, people... no, of course not. <laughs> <laughs> But I mean, if you're in the city, like, like you know, I, um, I'll give you an example. I went to the city of Leticia, in, uh, which is where Colombia, Peru, and Brazil meet on the Amazon River. There's this little town called Leticia. And close by there, you have all these lost tribes, quotations on that, okay? And everybody knows they're there, you know, the Ticuna, we know them. They, oh, the Ticuna, they're, they're down the river. Well, what do you think? If you're starving, let's assume, right? And there's, you're not gonna accept money. You might take your gun and go up there and do some justice or hunt hunt whatever they hunt and you, you become a competitor. You don't have to have a billion people, but, you know, you can have a lot of people go there and do their own hunting and even killing some of the natives. So I think a lot of that's going to go on. No well, one's gonna be, yeah, it's going to no, affect I mean, everybody on the planet. Well, so, I mean, I think that, I mean, I'm assuming that we get to this point where money doesn't have value, but I, if that happens, I agree your predictions seem reasonable, but I still don't see that that inevitably leads to is extinction because I mean, the, the, the population will drop precipitously in a matter of months. It'll go 99% of the people will be dead within months. For example. Um, and, um, and then you have you'll have things like you're talking about. People will try to start farms, 
pe people who know that, and then they'll be fighting over the land, over what's produced, and so forth. In different parts of the world, that's going to play out differently um, because different parts of the world, just there's more space or there's um, a different distribution of land or, or land that's arable, things like that. Um, and it just, given how adaptable humans are to different food sources, and look, humans already were <laughs> in a situation without governments, without, you know, um, laws and we that was in the that was in the paleolithic <laughs> that's true but my point is just that they survived and did really well i mean i agree to take modern humans and go back there and expect the same thing to happen is unreasonable but i don't see that it's impossible that human a society could develop fairly quickly um that you know protected its resources in a way that you know, in other words, you do need a community to trust one another, but I don't see why such communities couldn't form fairly quickly in the months after the disaster happens, if you have the right circumstances. And maybe that's not extremely likely, but I don't know that it's all, I, I don't think it's extremely improbable either. Okay, let me, let me add uh, something to that, that might also help you see that it does conduce to the extinction of man no matter how you look at it. Look at uh, graph number 13, if you can put that up there. Okay, this is the global population uh, that I put out. Uh, it's over really 100,000 years. Um, you're talking about maybe 200 to 300,000 years where we could still mate with one of our ancestors and have viable children. If you go back in time, like 400, 500,000 years ago, well, then we we might find some humanoid, some human-like creature, but we probably wouldn't be able to have uh, viable children with that person. So you could say that they're a different race at that point, only with those that would, with which we can reproduce uh, successfully, we will call them humans. And that would mean somewhere maybe between 200, 300,000 years ago. But here I start to chart at 100,000 years. And you can see the population was very, very low for most of that history. And right at the end, very end, that's when we got to 8 billion. Uh, you can see the graph just it grows exponentially. Okay. <laughs> but what's the issue? The issue is that this is an inbreeding chart. Uh, we've been inbreeding for 200 to 300,000 years ago. We had no input of new um, genes into our pool. And so what happens when you inbreed for such a long period of time, you have problems. You have genetic problems at the end of that uh, uh, process. And uh, an example is the Amish. Uh, they've been um, inbreeding in the United States for the last 350 years. They started out with about uh, 1,500. Today, they're like 350,000 uh, Amish, and they all descend from that small group. And today, they're having genetic problems. And uh, you also have the kings, you know, like the um, uh, Russian um, monarchy. They had Alexis, who uh, came from Queen Victoria. Uh, she was great grand. Uh, mother of uh, Alexei, the uh, son of Nicholas II. And he had uh, problems with his uh, blood. He was born that way, again, because of uh, inbreeding. Uh, Charles II of Spain, uh, 1700s, same thing. Um, inbreeding conduces, is, is not good. Not good at all. You cannot marry, uh, you know, you cannot marry your sister. But the issue is that, um, Whoever you marry today is either your sister or your brother, because we are uh, there's very little genetic diversity among the hum um, among the human race, and we're all essentially clones of each other. So from a genetic point of view, whoever you marry today is your sister or your brother, and when we reproduce for so long, uh, we end up with genetic problems. Now imagine a small pocket of people survive from that pool. That's your starting pool already loss of genetic diversity. Now you have a small group of people who survived. First of all, do you think they're gonna reproduce being you know, in that situation? 
And the, the second one is, uh, even if you do reproduce, what happens two or three generations later? Will you have uh, uh, children come out with genetic problems? So I think that one way or another, uh, we are checkmated. I think it's a way that Mother Nature has of guaranteeing that no species lives forever. Hmm. Hmm. Um, yeah, I'm, I mean, done, I'm done with the chart, uh, Jason. Oh, okay, all right. Uh, okay, so yeah, I mean, that's interesting. I, I think it's, I, I mean, I think you were being hyperbolic when you said- Yeah, yeah. I'm trying to be extreme so that I get my point across. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, so I'll let the hyperbole go. But um, yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I get another thought that I had as well. So humans have existed. Um, I mean, you said 200 to 300,000 years, genetically modern. Let's go with that. I've heard longer time frames than that. Mm -hmm. um, but still, there have been species that have lasted a lot longer than that. Yeah. Um, and so... Um, the smarter a species, the less it lives. So the genetic, but the, I'm, I'm out, just in terms of the genetic pool, uh, even if there is no input of new genetic information, which I think there probably is. Um, there is. I mean, uh, it's just Mutations. not enough. Yeah. Well, it's, uh, it's overcome by first uh, inbreeding, the fact that we marry each other and there's no outside input in our gene pool that's one issue then you have um um uh, you know uh, you have all these bottlenecks okay and you have uh, founders effects and so on where the small group from another small group new population starts you have all these situations that whittle uh the genetic pool or uh kind of streamline it and um uh, for example take a disease a smallpox it kills a lot of people throughout hundreds of years until we finally, it becomes endemic in a sense that you catch it, yeah, you get sick, but you don't die and you can still reproduce because now you have some antibodies. So the reason the Japanese, the Africans, the uh, Europeans are genetically similar has a lot to do with that. We went through the same, um, uh, what is it, uh, sif sifters which are the um, diseases. Mm -hmm. uh, your great grandfather, uh, he, he survived either because the bug didn't get to him or because it got to him and he was able to overcome it because he had some ancestors who already went through the process. So now he gave those defenses to you. And today, maybe, you know, you have resistance to a lot of diseases, especially childhood diseases that a lot of kids would die before the age of five, 200 years ago. They don't die anymore out of whooping cough and, uh, you know, some of chicken pox and so on. In the old days, it used to be a terrible, these used to be terrible diseases. Today, we take them for granted because nobody dies of them, you know, or very few people die of them. Why? Because our grandfathers did the job for us. And that means they streamlined our genetic code to a point where we are resistant to a lot of these diseases because they conquered them. They, those who did not conquer them, they died. And those who did are our grandfathers. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, that, yeah, we get a lot of this. Uh, and, and I think that's why our genetic pool is streamlined. Then talk about bottlenecks, wars, uh, accidents, whatever, you know. And then uh, you have also the um, uh, founder effect, you know, the fact that you have a small group from which, uh, you know, a new lineage, a new dynasty arises. Yeah, so I mean, I, I think that's yeah, that all seems reasonable and and exactly right. But um, and I'm, I'm what I'm about to say, I'm a, I'm somewhat reluctant to because I'm a pessimist by nature. But uh, you're a pessimist. I'm yes. an optimist. I drink beer and wine, so I'm an optimist. <laughs> but but when and I'm you... a real but I'm a realist. A realist realism is different than, than uh, pessimism. I'm not an, yes. a pessimist. I'm a realist. Yeah, yeah. So, um, but if you think about, I mean, so we are, humans have developed unprecedented technology. And one of the things that we're developing the ability to do is manipulate our own genome. Um, so in terms of the, the genetic pool of, you know, the human species, it does seem that it's not completely out of without out of their own possibility that 
within a hundred years or maybe less, we will be able to add to the artificially add information into the, uh, into the genome. Well, uh, there's two things on that. The first one is that I don't know what kind of monkey is going to come out of there. That's one issue. <laughs> you, you tamper too much with, with the genetic code. That's one. But uh, I think uh, extinction is coming a little sooner than a hundred years. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, all right. That, I mean, that, 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 that uh, you know, with respect to when it's going to happen, I'm I'm very skeptical of specific predictions. Yeah. Uh, when when you tell a story that says, well, this kind of thing could happen, money be could become non valuable. Uh, that I think that that's not. I don't sure it's going to happen, but I don't think it's out of the realm of possibility. And there are reasons that you mm -hmm. give that certainly make you think that it's not that it's maybe even uh likely more likely than not but with if you're going to say it's going to happen at this specific time within two decades three decades whatever i'm fairly suspicious about that fairly skeptical about that i should say well let me tell you because obviously i thought a lot about that as well and i'll give you this as a rule of thumb for you to think if all the uh rulers of the world today of every country they got together and they said Let's destroy the earth. Let's do it deliberately. Okay. Sometimes you think they do that. <laughs> but let's assume they all put their heads together and say, let's destroy the earth. Let's do it on purpose. Okay. So they manipulate their money supply, the interest rate, whatever they can do to uh, uh, make the extinction happen as soon as possible. Okay. Let's assume we did it deliberately. Okay. Well, uh, if we put our heads together, we would probably be able to kill uh, money in a matter of weeks. Okay, so that's now that gives you your lower limit. That's if we all agreed and we work towards killing ourselves, suicide. Now, let's look at the other end. Uh, if we did everything right, right, and not right according to what one group wants, but according to God or devil or mother nature or father universe. They look at it and they say, look, if humans do this, this, and this, they would live a hundred years. But if they don't do that, they do something less than ideal, that ideal situation, they would only live 50 years or 40 years or whatever. And so we're stuck between these two extremes, right? And we, we never do everything completely right. In other words, all the politicians, all the economists, they don't do everything perfectly right. In great measure, because we don't work through intelligence. We work through interest. Interest trumps intelligence. In other words, if intelligence says, look, what we need to do is impose communism on the world. That would be maybe what the intelligence tells us. But then you have some people say, hey, no, but if, if uh, we're all going to be equal and I got to share my money, et cetera, I don't want to do that. So I move the strings so that doesn't happen. Even though intelligence tells you maybe that's what you got to do, you don't do it because of interest. My personal interest gets in the way. And so what happens, we live in a less than optimi uh, optimal world in which interest takes over intelligence. If intelligence says you got to do this, interest will intervene and make it less than ideal. And therefore, we will never have this ideal situation which would make us maybe live longer it will just make us you know live somewhere between uh the few weeks if we committed suicide and the perfect uh world in which we do everything right and somewhere in between that's where it's going to happen <laughs> that's well, all i can tell you <laughs> yeah so i can't I mean, put a but... i can't give you a date i can't say the first of march of the, the year 2030 the last man's going to die i can't tell you that but what I can tell you is that we don't do everything perfectly, so we're not going to live uh, as long as we could if we did everything right, and we're not going to commit suicide. We're going to live somewhere. We're going to die somewhere in between. So I'm skeptical that we're very good at deciding what the lower bounds and the upper bounds are. I mean, even if all the leaders tried to do it, there may be resistance to it. There may be things that they don't factor in. That, that no, but that we're talking true. about here an ideal situation where all human beings agree, well, let's commit suicide. Yeah. You know, well, we, well, we, would, we could get rid of the earth in eight days, you know. Okay. <laughs> well, but then the upper bound, I'm still not sure that why should we think it's 100 years versus 300 years, right? Right. So anyway, but um, 
Yeah. Oh, food well, for thought. Um, that's that's what it's all about. It's for people to think of the arguments and reach their own conclusions. You know. Yeah. Well, I appreciate it. I I mean, it's um somewhat frightening if you're right. <laughs> no, um, but uh, if you're like me and you're uh, an optimist and you drink beer and wine, then it's okay. <laughs> It's like uh, in a hundred well, years, well, I'll be good. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yeah, uh, all righty. Well, that was a very good conversation. And once again, uh, I, you know, uh, thank you, uh, Jason and uh, Bill, for talking about this. And for anyone else that'd like to get uh, some more interesting interviews, uh, actually, I've interviewed uh, Jason and Bill already. Uh, you can just check out Freethinker Podcast. We talk a lot about physics and stuff like that. And then I've done some interviews with Bill Gady, too. Um, he used to be an ex-Cuban spy that worked with the CIA. And you can check out our interviews with me and him on more specifics on that. And he was featured on Fox News. They even covered, you know, when he was imprisoned and all that. And and uh, it's a very interesting uh, – he has a very interesting life. And uh, there's even a, a, a documentary film on him on, I think, Amazon Prime called El Crazy Chat that covers his life and stuff like that. And – so you got you talk a little more one day about all my experiences in prison. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've been, you can you can get so even. People know uh, what prison is really like. <laughs> all right, all right. Yeah, you can get even more detailed information from Bill. <laughs> yeah, he, he, he's the jack of all trades. It's not just you know the extinction of man. So yeah, feel free to check out my interviews and feel free to check out his uh, YouTube channel, Bill Gady. And, um, you know, you can have that as well. All righty. Well, thank you again, gentlemen. This was once again, a very interesting interview as long. And I'm glad, um, you know, uh, Jason had a lot of questions. So I know he was enjoying it. Um, and um, so this is going to be a good learning experience for everyone. I'm sure everyone's going to be talking about it and make making around. So um, in, a, in, in a couple of minutes, I will send you all this interview link as well. And you can share it with your friends and family, you know, do whatever you want with it. Thank you. All right. Thank you all again. Thank you. Peace.